for unit six, day 10. And they start on 2080 or page 2080 or packet. And we're looking at an integrated <coughs> integration technique called substitution. So uh, the essential question um, is still the same. How can I incorporate what I know about derivatives to find antiderivatives? So we know the antiderivative process is, is just running those derivative rules backwards, starting with your rate of change, accumulating that underneath between the rate of change and the horizontal axis. And we, when we do that, we end up with the function we started with before we differentiated and found a rate of change. So that's kind of the terminology we were accustomed to using during the first portion of the unit. Now what we're basically doing is we're boiling down that verbiage and saying, I may have the, uh, a definite integral or an integral and I would like to find the antiderivative. So um, we went through some basic uh, rules, went through all the basic differentiation rules to see how they would work as, has to see how we would use them when we were finding antiderivatives. And um, now we're gonna get to some of the more complex ones and the more complex ones involve substitution. So um, here is the uh, Webster Dictionary's definition of substitution, which uh, I'm not really sure I had to show you, but the idea is that, um, you know, just kind of like when you have a substitute in class, you're replacing someone or something with another person or thing. So you see, you see this all the time when you come to school and you have a substitute in your classroom. Um, and we are gonna physically do this also in some of the more complicated antiderivative questions. So um, for instance, when we look at this, uh, finding this antiderivative, three times the quantity five X plus two to the 20th power. Now, if that were just to the second power, we could foil it out. Um, but to the 20th power, I'm not sure we wanna do that. It's possible. And then we could just use the power rule. But um, the idea here is instead of spending all of that time foiling, um, we could look at this more like a composite function, right? We could look at this as three times something to the 20th, where the something is itself a function. So it is a, literally a composite expression. And you know that um, when you um, have a composite expression and you're differentiating, that we need to use the chain rule. So U substitution is literally the chain rule in reverse, right? Because we're really focusing on reversing our differentiation rules. And so this is no different. We're reversing our differentiation rule here. We're reversing our chain rule. So the first thing we do um, is, and in doing so, we're also going to reverse the power rule. Um, in, in doing so, um, we are going to take this and kind of pose this question here. Wouldn't it be easier if we solved uh, this expression. So the antiderivative of u the 20th, then we can literally just reverse the power rule. And so that's, that's the direction we're going to go in then is that we're going to take this out. We're going to kind of rip out the inner function of the, uh, of the composite expression and, and call it a u. And then we're going to go ahead and adjust this so it can look sort of like this. And I say sort of because we're, we've got a three we have to consider here and some other things. We've got a dx here and now it's a du and we don't know the relationship between dx and du. So, um, we, but we definitely want it something as simple as this so we can use a, a very basic antiderivative process. Okay, so let's go back. So we have this. That's what we physically have as our question. Um, I put the three out front because we can do that with, with constants. Um, that's just a coefficient. And then I'm going to focus on that. So I'm going to go ahead and do this substitution. Let u equals 5x plus 2. So we're going to put a u right here. But the problem is, is if we put a u here, then this differential has to be in terms of u as well. And so the way we get that connection is we go back to this inner function. And we say, well, I can differentiate that. That's pretty straightforward. And now I have a dx and a du, and I can substitute out the dx, just like I substituted out the 5x plus 2. So this is how we do this. We rearrange this differential, and we go ahead and cross-multiply, so to speak, right? Because this is 5 over 1. 
So it's du times one equals five times dx. We can do that cross multiply uh, process uh, with our differential expression. So we get this. And so we're, we're getting close. Um, we need the dx. So in order to get the dx by itself, we're gonna divide by five. So the dx is then du divided by five or one fifth du. Um, so if, if you think about it, um, just, just mathematically thinking about these three steps, we started with the derivative and all we did really did is swap the five and the dx, right? That's the cross multiply and divide process. So if you can get comfortable with just taking this and taking this and just swapping them, you can skip that intermediate step. Okay, so let's put this together then. So this is where the substitution takes place. Here's our original expression. Everything up here is what was on the previous screen, the previous screen and this. So here's the original um, expression. We're going to take out the 5x plus 2, and we're going to put in the u. We're going to take out the dx and put in the du over 5, the 1 -fifth du. So let's take a look at this. So from a composite standpoint, you remember the derivative is the um, differentiating the outer function and evaluating it at the inside times the derivative of the inside. So this is the reversal of that process. Instead of multiplying by the inside derivative, we are dividing by the inside derivative, right? This is the inside. This is the derivative of the inside. We're doing a division process. We're, we're, review, we're reversing that chain rule. Um, okay, so this is just one fifth du. So I'm going to factor out the one fifth and stick it with the three. So I got three over five. Now I have something that is a, is a basic reversal of the power rule. So we have three fifths times u bump up the power by one to the 21 divide by 21. So there's our power rule. It's an and, and let's simplify this a little bit. Three and 21 can be reduced to one over seven. So it looks like we have one over 35 u to the 21. And um, we're almost done. Um, we know we started out in terms of X so, and we need to end up in terms of X. So we need to substitute again, get the U out and put back our original expression. So it's one over 35, five X plus two to the 21. And then um, ooh, I forgot something pretty critical here. So let me do that. And don't forget that. Hopefully this will solidify that don't forget that plus c on the end there we go so we definitely need that plus c on the end uh, to complete the antiderivative process so hopefully um <clears throat> oops, hopefully me stopping the uh presentation and putting that correction in will help you remember that uh to do that on each antiderivative question okay so let's formally look at what's going on here um so Typically, substitution involves finding a pattern that looks like this, a nested function and its derivative. Now, the one we just got doing, got done doing, did not have, they had the nested function, but it didn't have the derivative out here. Remember, the derivative was five. We didn't have that. And, um, it, and, and that is one of the scenarios where that's okay, because the derivative is just a numeric constant and it comes out anyway. Um, I'll show you some, some examples that follow this pattern quite literally, where we have a composite, and then out here we have the derivative of the inside. Because this is the chain rule right here, right? We've got the derivative of the, uh, we've got the, uh, um, we've got, remember this is the derivative of the original function, right? So we've got the derivative of the outside evaluated at the inside times the derivative of the inside. And so, um, and so our substitution that's involved is doing that U substitution and um, manipulating the differentials, then manipulating the derivative of the inside, so to speak, uh, to get that DU expression. Now, if we had a definite integral, we also would have to change the bounds to get those in terms of U as well. We're gonna do an example like that a little later in the notes. Um, so here are, we, we didn't go through them formally, but here are seven steps that we can follow to kind of navigate this process. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna follow these seven steps pretty closely from here on in. 
Um, so remember this nested function we um, we call that. Whoops, we call that nested function a, a uh, composite. Okay, so um, we're going to look for the function and its derivative. We're going to look for that pattern. Um, example one that we just got done doing that it was kind of tricky because we didn't see this pattern because the derivative was a numeric constant. Um, and we're going to example two is going to be a, a tricky one as well. So let's take a look at example two. So we need to look for that function and its derivative pattern. But um, in this anti in this anti derivative question, we just have tangent and three x. And so if you think about you know well which one's the function, which one's the derivative, it, it doesn't make sense because um the, neither are the derivative of the other one so this one is a tricky one again we don't see a a function in its derivative i see a function tangent and certainly the inside is 3x of the composite but i don't really see a uh, um, a derivative of a tangent so what we want to do then is we, we want to think about well how can i rewrite this to get that pattern and the way we can rewrite tangent um, since we don't have that pattern, is we can rewrite it as sine over cosine. So if I rewrite it sine over cosine, then I have a function cosine and its derivative sine or vice versa, um, because we know that we can kind of work those those trig functions either way. Um, so the question is, is, well, which way do we do this? Is the function sine or is the function cosine? And so a, a rule of thumb here is if you have a rational function, Make the bottom u, and then the top will end up being the uh, the derivative. So um, it, it just ends up being an easier um, integration when we do that. So we're, that's what we're going to do. We're going to say u is cosine three x. We're going to differentiate that. So du dx is the derivative of cosine is minus sine three x. But then we have we actually have a chain rule in here. Now this is just straight. Whoops! This is just straight up differentiation. So um, we we need to do the chain rule when we uh, when we are doing the derivative here. So it's negative three sine three x. So the negative comes from differentiating cosine. The three comes from differentiating the inner uh, function here three x. Okay. So now we need to rearrange that. So I'm just going to do the old. I call this the switcher rule. Uh, I know I need to solve, solve for dx, so I'm going to stick dx over here, and I'm going to stick everything over here down on the bottom. Okay, so I, that's the cross multiply and divide. So dx is this big complicated thing. Now, it, you may look at this and think, this isn't, it, it doesn't seem to make anything any easier, but watch the canceling that occurs when we do the substitution. Okay, so I'm going to color code things here. I am going to substitute cosine three X, I'm gonna substitute in U, and I'm gonna substitute in this messy thing for DX. And I know it doesn't look like it's gonna get simpler, but just kind of watch what pans out here. So this is a U. I have this whole big complicated thing here, and we have some canceling occurring. So this is what will happen all the time. When we do the substitution, if there is any, <clears throat> any expression that still has an X in it, this substitution, finding the derivative and substituting out the dx, will take care of any remaining x expressions. So we can cancel the uh, the sine of 3x, top and bottom. We have a negative one third here, and so we're going to put the negative one third outside, out front of the integration, and then we have one over u du. Right, this u is in the denominator. Make sure it stays in the denominator. So now we're left to do the antiderivative of one over u, which is much simpler than this. We know that the antiderivative of one over u, if you look at your derivative flip books, that is reversing the natural log. So we're going to integrate that. The antiderivative of one over u is the natural log of u. And, um, and then now we can substitute back in. So we can go ahead and put back in our substitution of cosine 3x and put our plus c on the end. And this is the antiderivative of the tangent of 3x. OK, let's take a look at example 3. So example 3, you might be able to see the, um, the u substitution, the function and its derivative sort of a little more obviously. Uh, but it's still pretty tricky. So 
general rule of thumb here, like the last time, you know, the trig problem, we had to rewrite the tangent and then we had to, we, we got this rational expression and the general rule of thumb is when you have rational expression, the U is in the bottom. Um, we can kind of say the same thing here, but we also have an exponential here and exponentials kind of um, are a higher priority than rational expressions. So exponentials, we're gonna make the power U. And you know these are things that you just have to kind of keep in mind as you practice these problems. They're like little tricks. And so, but think about this, this is also the denominator. Now, the, the tricky thing here is that if we call U the square root of X, then this is E to the U. And we have to look at this in the denominator as a derivative because it's really one over the square root of X. And that is the derivative of the square root of X. Remember, if we do a power rule on this, let's differentiate this. This is X to the half power. We bring down the half, we reduce the power by one. And if we rewrite this, we end up with a square root in the denominator. So that is exactly what we have here. So this is actually the derivative and this is actually the function. This, this derivative form here is, is because we have a one in the numerator and a root X in the denominator. One in the numerator, root X in the denominator. We have to bring this two through, but watch, watch what happens as we do. Okay, so we have this. I'm just getting, out, getting rid of this middle stuff. Now I'm gonna cross multiply. So we got dx times one equals two root x du. So this is what's going to go in for dx. So let's do that substitute. Let's uh, let's do that uh, substitution here. So for this u, I'm going to put it up here for root x. I'm going to leave this alone because I'm going to substitute this in for dx to root x du, and the root x's will cancel. So let's take a look at uh, what that looks like. So um, that substitution then looks like this. So we have e to the u, and then we still have the root x in the bottom, we're not moving that. And then the dx is gonna be two times root x du. And then we're gonna be able to cancel the root x's. <clears throat> and um, this two is in the numerator, right? This is, a, this is all in the numerator. This two is gonna come out front. And then we're going to have e to the u du. And um, when we integrate e to the u du, we get 2 e to the u. Remember, e to the u is its own derivative, so it must be its own antiderivative. And this came up a little before we needed it. And, um, and then we're going to go ahead and sub we're going to rewrite it and substitute back in the square root of x. So this antiderivative is 2 e to the root x plus c. So if we think about differentiating this, we're gonna, if we differentiate this to kind of check our work here, um, the derivative of two e to the root x is two e to the root x times the derivative of root x. So if you think about this times this, right, because e is its own derivative, see how the twos cancel? And then we end up with the root x back in the denominator. And of course, differentiating a constant of integration, this would be zero, because remember, this is just a number. That we get that because we can have any y-intercept. This is a family of functions. Um, okay, so you can stop the video and try this one on your own. Um, again, it's an exponential, so make the power u. <clears throat> so go ahead and try to stop the video and try to do this one on your own. Okay, if you're joining me back, um, hopefully you made it through um, up through step six. Okay, try steps one through six. Um, try not to do step seven um, because we, are, we do have a definite integral here. So um, let's go through this. So our u is our power for x squared minus one. We can see that this is a form of the derivative. When we differentiate four x squared, we get eight x. And so we have an x here and an x here and the coefficients don't match and that's okay. That just means we get, we get some coefficients outside. But um, we, we, have, we have matching um, powers of x here and, and that's, so this, this is the derivative. So we look at three x as kind of like a form of the derivative. 
Um, it's got the right power of X, and that's what the important thing is. The numbers, the coefficients, <coughs> excuse me, the coefficients will work out, will work themselves out. Okay, so um, let's solve for DX. So I'm going to do that swapping. We put the 8X down here and the DX up there. That's the cross multiply and divide. And now I'm going to go ahead and do my substituting. So you, this goes in for, uh, U goes in for 4X squared minus 1. DU over 8X goes in for DX. Um, so the, now the, um, the integral looks like this. It looks like 3X E to the U times DU over 8X. And if you notice, I got rid of the upper and lower bounds. Um, these upper and lower bounds refer to uh, doing an antiderivative in terms of X. And we are no longer going to be in terms of the variable X. So these, these upper and lower bounds are no longer going to be th 0 and 3. We've got to figure out what those are. So what I do is I just leave them off until I do all of the anti-differentiation. And then I put them on at the end. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and cancel. So the X's here are cancel, and we end up with three over eight. So we're gonna put that out front, and we're taking the antiderivative of E to the U du. And we know that, that the antiderivative of E to the U du is itself. So um, we got three eighths E to the U. And um, and now we've got to now we've got to evaluate this. This would be the antiderivative if we put plus C on the end, but we have a definite integral. So now we got to bring back in the lower and the upper bounds. So the upper bound is three, and I've got to put it in here because that's in terms of x. So four times three squared minus one is thirty-four. It's thirty-five. Excuse me. So um, so use the upper bound in terms of u is thirty-five, and then I've got to do the same thing for zero. I've got to put it up into here to get it in terms of u. So we have four times zero squared minus one is negative one. So that's the lower bound. So we're going to evaluate this from negative 1 to 35. So it's going to look like that. Um, so the, the value of the definite integral here then is 3 eighths e to the 35 minus e to the negative 1. Um, and <clears throat> we just leave it like that. We don't try to evaluate that without a calculator. Um, so that would be the value of the definite integral. Um, so the last one then is example 5. And it's rational. And um, again, um, with rational, the rule of thumb is make the bottom u. So the bottom, uh, if the bottom is going to be u, um, then where your substitution is going to be 3x plus 1. So go ahead and stop the video and try to do this one all the way through, um, even step 7, even, even rewriting the lower and the upper bounds and um, evaluating uh, the limit. Or the evaluating the integral, excuse me. Um, so go ahead and try that. Stop the video and try that on your own. Okay, if you're coming back now, I'm assuming you've tried this U sub on or this use this integration and U sub on your own. So let's go through the steps here. Step two is to differentiate your U, so your du dx is three. Step three is to solve for dx. So with this one, we can just do the swapping. So it's du over three equals dx. Step four is to do the substitution for the u and the dx. So we are going to have the, uh, and I'm going to get rid of the limits of integration right now because we're going, <clears throat> we're transforming this to a u problem instead of an x problem. So we get two over u times du over three. So we have a, um, a coefficient of two thirds we're going to put out front. There is no canceling because um, this derivative is numeric. And when the derivative is numeric, all the only thing that happens is the coefficients change. Um, so there's no canceling that we need to do. Um, so we are integrating two thirds is out front one over u du. And we've, we integrated this already in this uh, note session. We know this is natural log of the absolute value of u. So this is two thirds the natural log of the absolute value of u. And then now we need to get our lower and our upper bounds in terms of u. So if x equals 5, and I put 5 into here, I get 3 times 5 plus 1, which is 16. And if x is equal to 1, I put 1 into here, and we get 3 times 1 plus 1, which is 4. Right? 3 times 1 is 3, plus 1 is 4. 
So our new um, bounds for, for uh, evaluation of this antiderivative is 16 and 4. So we're going to evaluate that. Um, and so that means we're going to stick in 16 and stick in 4. And so it looks like this. And um, if this were a free response question, he, this is an answer, an algebraic answer. You would just leave it alone and move on. If this were a multiple choice question, the answer is probably not going to be in this form. So I'm going to go over what we can do for natural log, uh, re-expressing the natural log um, to rewrite this expression. So um, these are these are logarithmic properties that you may remember, you may not, but we need to kind of dust off the cobwebs and figure these out. Okay, so remember that when we have a natural log of a number minus a natural log of a number, um, that we can rewrite that as a quotient. If there it was a plus here, well, we could rewrite it as a product. So keep that in mind. Um, and then 16 divided by 4, we can simplify that. That's a natural log of 4. Um, in addition, 4 is a perfect square, so we can rewrite this as natural log of 2 squared. And that's important because a power can come out front. Okay, and natural log is really um, counting by power. So powers can come out front. So this can be rewritten as 2 thirds times 2 times natural log of 2. Well, we can simplify this. That's really 4 thirds. So 4 thirds natural log of 2 is probably the answer you're going to see on a multiple choice question, even though you got this. So you have to recognize those logarithmic properties um, so that you can rewrite this to figure out which one um, is, is the rewritten correct answer. All right, when we get back into the classroom, um, we'll go over some more use substitution and refine our skills um, with a variety of problems. <laughs>